Hi, everyone. This is Eric Coles. Uh, our friend Alex is, I guess, in Abu Dhabi, so he's not here tonight. So I've, I'm taking over, at least for the moment. And tonight we have uh, Ron Breacher to give a presentation on some of the new uh, features for PixInsight. Um, I think most of us are PixInsight users, so we're really going to benefit that. I don't have to say much about Ron. He's a, a master astrophotographer and presenter. Uh, his site is astrodoc.com. I think that's right, isn't it, Ron? And if you go there, you'll see just a, a wealth of really fine images. Astrodoc.ca. Oh, I'm sorry, astrodoc.ca. Uh, he also goes out on the road and gives uh, presentations with uh, Warren Keller on Fifth Insight. And so I think we're going to get a little piece of that tonight. Before we get going, I just want to remind everyone that our website is really up and running. You can go there and you can find out what's coming up on the Astro Imaging channel. We'll probably be upgrading that in the future, but we'll, we'll let you know when that comes along. Uh, other than that, uh, Ron, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. I'm going to share my screen. And then minimize that. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to cover some new tools and techniques for Pix Insight. Uh, I'm also going to show you how to fix a couple of uh, common problems that people sometimes have with stars, uh, with with deep sky images, I should say. And uh, before I get too far with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some advanced workshops that Warren and I have coming up. So uh, we'll cover recent additions to Pix Insight, and uh, this is current to version 1.8.8.4. And then I want to uh, deal with correcting chromatic aberration in one-shot color images and brightening dark pixels to smooth the background. Um, so Warren and I uh, have taught eight beginner workshops around the U.S. and Canada over the last two years, starting in uh, Buffalo, actually, in April 2018. And now there has been demand for more advanced workshops. So these uh, are for experienced Pix Insight users. We expect people to be proficient in all of the uh, material that was covered in the beginner workshop. And we'll be looking at the newest features of Pix Insight, some of which I'm going to touch on tonight. Uh, advanced mask making, making mosaics, uh, deconvolution in detail, including using uh, relatively new scripts to help build the point spread function, advanced pixel math, blending narrow and broadband data, and other topics. And one of the things about these uh, workshops is that we include 45-minute uh, sessions, four of them during the two days, where you can work on your own data with help from Warren and I. So you basically uh, get to work on the things that are most important to you at the time. I've given a link here because I know this uh, gets recorded and will be available in the future. So you can use this link to get more information and register. We have... Uh, a great bunch of sponsors and some great door prizes to give away, including one-shot color cameras, discount coupons for cameras and filters, and more. Uh, this is just a quick flyover of the agenda for the two days. So you'll see that we're going to be doing um, local normalization. A lot of people are interested in that when you have a, an image set of variable quality. We'll look at drizzle, inter drizzle integration for undersampled images. Uh, a lot of time spent doing deconvolution and some of the alternative de delinearization tools. Whole bunch of different techniques for making masks, narrow band processing, X and so on. So uh, be a very, very full two days, uh, but of course, lots of fun too. Anyway, here's some of the things that are going to get covered in that workshop. They're relatively new 
uh, tools and updates for PIX Insight. And as I go through this part of the talk, I'm going to give you a slide like this one where I talk a little bit about what the thing is. And then I'm going to switch over to PIX Insight and uh, show you how it works. So the first thing I want to talk about is the weighted batch pre-processing script. It's uh, basically a build out on the original batch pre-processing script, but it has a lot of important improvements. If you use uh, some CMOS cameras have difficulty getting good bias frames. And with those cameras, you need to shoot flat darks. Those are dark frames that match the flats in their exposure time. This new script, the weighted batch pre-processing script, has the ability to use flat darks along with the uh, light darks that you use for your light frames. It includes a, a frame weighting algorithm that's similar to subframe selector that considers things like the signal to noise ratio, how small the stars are, and what the shape of the stars are. Uh, in, in weighting all of the frames prior to stacking. And it also allows you to have multiple exposure times for uh, a single filter. So with the old script, each filter, all the, uh, all the files would be grouped together regardless of exposure time. In the new script, you can set a tolerance for grouping or separating filters, um, images based on exposure time. And there's some automatic settings that are really helpful. One of them is that this new script can automatically identify the best frame to use for star alignment based on the algorithm that you choose. And it will automatically determine the best pixel rejection algorithm. This, in other words, the sigma clipping algorithm. So let's, uh, I'm going to just flip over to Pix Insight and we can have a look at this. Uh, this is the weighted batch pre-processing script window. Uh, and it probably looks familiar to you if you've used the batch pre-processing script. So it's basically got a left side for files where they're all loaded up. It's got on the right side, the global settings that apply to the whole image. And then in the center, the panels change depending on which tab you're looking at. So all of that should look familiar. And like its predecessor, it has the ability to use cosmetic correction. You can debare one shot color images just by selecting CFA images here. But it has this new uh, category called subframe weighting, and it will generate uh, it'll measure and generate weights for each frame in the set based on the weighting parameters that you can select. And there are multiple presets. So you can choose a nebula, galaxy, or a star cluster preset. And you can see how these weighting factors change for each of those. You can also set your own. Um, I'm just going to reset that tool. There we go. I told you that uh, you can have multiple exposure times for filters. So here's a bunch of five minute exposures. And below it, a group exposure tolerance to more than 600 seconds. It's going to put them all together into a single group. If I use less, they're separated. And when they're separated in this way, I'm going to leave it back at its default. When they're separated in this way and you run the script, you'll get two masters with different exposure times that you could then use, for example, for uh, HDR combination or something like that. Right underneath the weighting parameters button is this ability to use the best frame as reference for registration. So it can generate all these subframe weights with the parameters you choose, then select the best frame to use for registration. 
registration uh, now has distortion correction, which was not available previously. And in image integration, you'll notice that now you can select a rejection method or you can leave it at auto and let the script decide which method is best. And that's what I generally would do. So when you have this set at auto and, and we've, uh, we've also set the registration, uh, to use the best frame for registration, you see this is now grayed out. We don't have to specify a registration reference image. The script is gonna take care of that for us. We still have to specify an output directory. And I'm just going to uh, create one here. And select it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all of the short frames and almost all of the long frames, because otherwise this will just take too long to run. But as it runs, I'm going to walk you through. I'm also using master calibration frames that were prepared with the previous run of this script. Uh, I think that's everything. We've still got the diagnostics button that will, ah, that's warning me of, uh, this is, a, I believe, an error in the most recent version of the script that I installed today. This switch should always be checked. It looks now like it might be not the default setting that it was yesterday. That should always be checked. The good news is when we try to uncheck it or when we try to run the diagnostics, we get a warning about it. Bad practice. Okay, so now it should say the diagnostics completed okay. We can run the script. So here it's calibrating my target frames. Run. run. Now it's demosaic thing then. Oh, and I'll stop okay. and see if there's a question while it debears okay. those frames. Okay, Ron, we've got a few people asking, is it possible to zoom in a little? Sure. So you can see this is uh, now demosaic and the calibrated frames. And now it's starting to measure the images. So it's got calibrated light frames that have been debared, and it's converting them to grayscale and measuring the full width half maximum, how round the stars are, and the signal to noise ratio. And it will use these three measurements to calculate how much weight to give that image in the final mix. It's also going to fight, figure out which is the best image to use for registration right after it finishes uh, image number three here. Okay. It's just saying it's overwriting, which is fine. And now it's registering. The reason why it was overwriting is it was writing the new weighting information into the FITS header of those files. Now it's registering them. <clears throat> I promise this is the slowest demo. Come on. Any questions while it's running? There are a few questions. Uh, yes, Ron, I've had... from... Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go, go for it, Eric. I, I noticed that this script takes a lot longer to run than the previous script. Uh, that's not my imagination, right? Um, it takes a lot longer because it does an extra step of measuring the statistics of all the stars. And uh, for this demonstration, I'm using particularly large files. It's a 36 megapixel camera. 
and it's one shot color. So a single file after debearing is 471 megabytes. So uh, I guess there's just a lot of data to calculate here. Okay, so now what's going on is it's doing the integration. And it should be done in just a moment. While that finishes, maybe I will go back uh, to my presentation and just talk about a little update in image integration. You might have noticed it when we were looking at uh, batch preprocess uh, the weighted batch preprocessing. There's a new algorithm for that sigma rejection. Uh, and it's called the generalized extreme studentized deviate method or GESD method. It gives better preservation of detail and better identification of outliers for large sets of images. They recommend 25 or more. It'll run on three, uh, but they say 25 or more and more than 50 is better. One of the nice things is, is that uh, the weighted batch preprocessing script will automatically select this algorithm if it happens to be appropriate. Let's just go back and you'll see the script is finished running. This is another new feature with this script is that you get a nice little report window. Uh, it's also much more error tolerant than the previous version of the script. So in the past, if you had a failure, for example, on one filter during calibration, the script would stop. Uh, in this case, it will just move on to the next filter set. So more tolerant of errors also gives you a nice report on what happened. You can select all that text and copy it into a text file if you wish. Of course, you could also have selected to save the process load. If we close out of that script, all of the output has been placed into the folder that we asked it to be put into, sorted nicely into frames that have been calibrated and debared, then registered, and finally integrated. And there's the integrated master. Okay. Any questions about the weighted batch preprocessing script? I've got a few questions from Linda. She asks, is there a way to handle multiple sessions in the same instance of batch weighted batch pre weighted batch preprogramming? If I have three nights of data with the same filter, or do I have to run three different sets of flats? If you've moved anything, uh, like if you've taken the camera off and put it back on, or if you've rotated it, then you'll need different flats for each night. And in that case, what I'd recommend that you do, uh, let's, let's pretend that instead of uh, being different exposure lengths, these are different nights. They would all be together. So I'll make them look like they're all together. What I would do is I would just do calibrate only. And then I would manually, um, so it would calibrate and then debear them. And then I would manually register them. I would calibrate one night, then calibrate the other night to that in two separate runs, and then do the registration and integration of both nights together. One of the interesting things about this, uh, let's clear. Let's clear the whole shoot and match here. I'm going to add just some calibrated lights, calibrated and debared. And if I run the diagnostics, it'll give me, oh, I didn't specify an output directory, but we won't worry about that. It will tell me that I haven't selected any calibration frames, but it will allow me to run. 
So you can run the batch preprocessing script on previously calibrated frames. You just have to uh, clear clear out all of the calibration tabs. I hope that answers the question. So I would do calibrate only on each set individually, then put them all together for the remaining steps. Ron, uh, yes. is there any chance that this eventually will become a process rather than a script? Uh, there's always a chance, I guess, but I don't think so. Uh, if you read uh, on the forum and if you read the warnings when you use the script about image integration, uh, the, the makers of PixInsight, Juan Conajero primarily, uh, believes that the script, using the script for integration gives inferior results to doing it manually. So uh, I think it will resist it becoming a process. Uh, generally, I do drizzle integration, uh, if, especially if I'm shooting above two arc seconds per pixel. I use drizzle integration, so I have to manually integrate. Uh, so I don't always use the script for that. But when I've compared the results from the script to the best results I can get manually, I can see maybe a small numerical difference, like in the fourth decimal place or third decimal place. But in practice, the script gives nearly as good result as, as I can get doing it manually. Okay. I got a question, got a question from John. Sure. Uh, please, please ask Ron about the numerical pixel rejection limits with the student dies process. Ah. That's going to be in here. So these, uh, these uh, are lit up or not, depending on which rejection method you choose. So if you choose percentile clipping, those two sliders are active. If you choose sigma clipping, the sigma low and high are active. Anything that says sigma or linear fit or the ESD outliers, these are all standard deviations. So if you want to reject more pixels, you slide to the left. In other words, you have a tight, you're, you're, you're only allowing uh, values very close to the mean to be considered valid. If you want less sigma clipping, you move to the right. In general, uh, I've always found that the defaults work very, very well. Uh, and if you set this on auto, all of the sliders become active and you can set them to whatever you want. But again, in general, if I'm using the script, I've found leaving these as they are works very, very well. Uh, I've never had to move them from the script. If I'm doing image integration manually, well, let's just have a look at that. If I'm doing image integration manually, then uh, what I might do is do an experiment with just a preview. So here I might select just a small region of interest from a preview. You can select whatever preview you want and uh, run that integration over and over, adjusting these settings. Now, one of the things that I generally do is I change the range low. If I'm doing it manually, I add a one there. That way, completely black pixels are not considered in the calculation. Completely black pixels would either be defective or they would be from an edge artifact. All right. I think I'm going to press on. So we talked, we talked a little bit about this. Linear pattern defect tools. If you look in the lower right of this slide, you'll see an example, <coughs> excuse me, of a real head scratcher 
for for some imagers you after you've done your your best calibration <clears throat> you can be left with these lines and they may not be perfectly aligned if you've been dithering they might be uh, separated from each other after you've stacked Vicente Paris recently developed two scripts that can help with this type of thing. Uh, one is the linear defect detection script. The other is the linear pattern subtraction script. As you can tell by the name, the first one detects these full or partial rows or columns that need to be corrected. And it can create an image that shows those defects or it can output the position of the defects to a file that um, uh, either the next script, linear pattern subtraction, or cosmetic correction can use the next time you're running a set of images. Linear pattern subtraction goes one step further. It can uh, correct defects that are either specified by the first script in that outputted file or it can just search the whole image by itself. So let me um, show you how that works. Here's a, a, an excerpt from an image that we want to correct. And you can see very clearly these uh, nasty dark lines. Maybe it'll help if I zoom in. And maybe it will also help if, uh, I'm going to bring up the screen transfer function and make this really obvious. Sorry, I got to be able to see it. There we go. You can really see them well. And there's some fainter ones to the left side as well. Okay, so if we go to the script menu under utilities, the two scripts are right down here, linear defect detection, linear pattern subtraction. Now the second script, linear pattern subtraction, is going to call the first script anyway, so you're going to see how it works. I'm just going to run this one. Uh, Bottom line is we can, we can specify an output place for the image, or it'll just make a new image for us on the desktop. We can correct columns that are specified in a defect file. I made a defect file uh, previously. It looks like this. So I could have done that. These settings I've never found you need to change. This I haven't found you need to change, but if you've got a lot of nebula, you might want to define a background reference region. And you have to figure out where that should be before you start. Because as we know, when a script is active, you're locked out of anything else in Pix Insight. Uh, when you're ready to run this script, Oh, sorry, we're not going to correct columns from a defect file. We're going to scan the entire image. So this is going to call the other script, find the defects, and then correct them. Here we go. And I believe that is done. I'm just going to demagnify this so we can... That's odd. Just a second here. It must have done something incorrectly. It worked before, I promise. <clears throat> hmm. I'm not sure why it's not. Uh, oh, I know why, because it's, I do have to click correct columns. It was correcting the rows. Very new script, my apologies, guys. 
correct columns, not rows, correct the entire image. There we go. Three times lucky. I always tell people I've just made more mistakes. Uh, Ron, we've got yes. a few people asking about uh, what are the dark lines? How are they created in CCD? Is it CCD specific or is it, does it happen on CMOS as well? Uh, it's it's more common. I, I don't see any dark lines on either of the CCD, uh, yeah, on either of the um, CMOS cameras I've used. I, I see them, I, I don't have many of these at all. I had a hard time finding with this kind of defect in it. I but, have lots of uh, some. <laughs> well, after calibration, most of them should be gone unless there's a defect right in the substrate. And and there you could use cosmetic correction. But this these scripts are a better way to get that cosmetic correction template, at least for the columns. Like, look how beautifully that works. I have tried that, and they work phenomenal. Yeah. It's really, it's, really well. Really good. All righty. Uh, let me go back to my PowerPoint. So, Ron, uh, yeah, that is done on your uh, linear images, right? Uh, not everything, but so far, what we've done is on it, on linear. Yes. So, would you also do it on nonlinear images or stacked images? I don't know. Why don't we find out? Great question. Like I say, I don't have this type of defect. So I've learned how to use the script because I, I want to be able to demonstrate it. Here, let's just auto zero that. And we'll make it enough so that we can see it. Hang on a second. Where is it? Just a second. I have to undo the script. There it is. Let's darken everything down. Okay, so there it is. Let's see if let's see if the script can fix that. So we'll go back to the script. We'll correct the entire image rather than with a defects file. And yes, it did it. So this will work on stretched images as well as unstretched images. All right. Any other questions before I move on? That looks good. Starnet. So StarNet is a tool for removing stars from an image, and you can see this image of the uh, Sol Nebula with the stars having been removed. It's not only nice for making this type of image, if that's your taste, but also very useful for making mass. So sometimes we want to isolate everything but the stars. Sometimes we want to isolate the stars. Uh, and StarNet also gives us a new way of making a star mask that I'm going to show you in a, in a moment. It's not part of the standard uh, PixInsight release, so you have to get the files and instructions yourself. You download them from SourceForge, and I've given a link here. And then you have to install manually from the Process Modules, Install Modules tab, so I'll show you where that is. Let's uh, put these away and magnify so everybody can see where this is. So if you go and the process menu down near the bottom is modules, all modules. And this is where you can search, uh, install any modules that you've copied into the appropriate place. But as I said, um, Go and find that information uh, on the PixInsight forum and the links to the StarNet module. 
Okay. This is how it works. First of all, it can be tough to find. It's under the etc tab at the very bottom. But if you can't I'm remember an that. Echo from somebody. Somebody's making an echo. Not sure. Uh, process. If you can't find it under etc and you can't remember where it is, go to all processes where everything is listed alphabetically and you'll find Starnet there. Uh, it says it's beta, and I occasionally get errors here if Pix Insight, or let's say if my PC is not in the correct folder for Starnet to work. So if we get that error, we'll fix it. You, the only thing that's changeable here uh, numerically is the stride. The lower the value, the higher the quality, but the longer it takes and the increase in time is exponential. So if you go from 128 to 64, it takes about three times as long. You can, rather than creating a starless image, you can create a star mask, not both. So I'm gonna show you a way to create both without waiting for the time that this takes. Let's apply this right now. One of the other things that's unusual about Starnet is that while it's running, it doesn't give you any display. The process console doesn't open up. All of the uh, controls of Pix Insight become frozen. You just have to have faith that it hasn't. I'm hoping that that will improve. There's the result. So before, after. And Ron, we got a question from El Michael. Could you show the best way to remove star residuals after using Starnet? The best way to remove star residuals after using uh, Starnet is actually to do to use Starnet sooner in the workflow. So this is very near the end of the workflow where I'm showing you this demonstration, and it's working pretty darn well. Um, you might have to use a clone stamp or something to get rid of that. That would be harsh. I think maybe what I would do is uh, apply a curve here and darken things down near the bottom. Without losing the nebula. That's better, but you'll get a better result. So what, I, what, what I've just demonstrated for you is I took a, an essentially finished image and removed the stars from it. If you plan on making a starless image, you should apply Starnet right after stretching before you do anything else. So remove the stars as soon as you've taken the image non-linear, and then you won't be processing the stars further, making them harder to remove later. So that's Starnet. Now I said I wanted to show you um, how to use this, how to use this to uh, make a star mask. So I'm just going to make a clone of that image by dragging its tab off, its view identifier tab. I just dragged it off, and I'm going to undo this. So I've got an image with stars now, and an image without stars, and now I can use Pixel Math. to take the original and subtract the clone. So, oops, Starnet demo minus Starnet demo clone. I don't know if you can see the minus sign. You can put spaces in these expressions to make it easier to see what's going on. And for a destination, I'm going to create something new. I'm doing subtraction, so I don't need to rescale. And let's go ahead and apply that. And here I have a colored star mask. 
I could process these stars separately and then put them back into the image later on. That's the Starnet demo. Ron? With a little, yes. Uh, I probably spent half my imaging life doing uh, Hubble palette images and working yes. with this images in order to uh, do tone map. And every new way to remove stars that's come along, I've tried. And there's no doubt that this is by far the best available. And of course, it's free. Uh, so I, would I agree with you. I would recommend this to anyone. I mean, if, if you're doing, doing tone maps, this is the process you want to use. Also, it works on color images, which uh, some, a standalone program really doesn't. And it works better than the Photoshop processes that I've been using. This is a, this is a big thing for me personally. But check this out. So I've just extracted the luminance from my Starnet demo. I'm just going to rename that Loom. Let's apply Starnet to this. Shouldn't take too long. I made this nice and small, so it would only take about 20 seconds. This can take minutes. And remember, everything freezes, so you might think your computer's locked up. I think the instructions warn you. I posted the yeah. link and warned you about that. Yeah. Now, now, if you look at this, is this not a fantastic uh, mask for uh, doing something with this guy? So say I wanted to just boost the contrast within the nebula. I've now put this starless image here on here as a mask, you can see it, there it is. I can use curves on this image to make that mask a little more efficient. There we go. And now I've got the color image selected. I can work specifically on the color uh, on the nebula, I should say, to boost its brightness without boosting the background, perhaps to boost its saturation a little bit, even to change the hue. Maybe where, uh, maybe where I see orange, I want to make it bluer. See how I was able to isolate that area with the mask that was made using Starnet. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? Uh, not at this time. Looks good. Okay, great. So now I want to just uh, go from the new stuff to dealing with a couple of problems that I've noticed either in my own images or in other people's images. Um, and the first one is chromatic aberration. So I, I hadn't used a one-shot color camera for, well, ever. And um, on my Takahashi, I'm using a reducer, a focal reducer, that it turns out I learned from Takahashi was not actually designed for this scope. So my sensor is bigger than the corrected field and the corners of my images look like this. So you can see, uh, although the stars are, you know, reasonably round, if we weren't looking at them blown up like this, the color channels are out of alignment. What's worse is, as I'll show you when we look at the images, the four corners are all different, right? The aberration, the red always is towards the edge. 
So the orientation is different. So I came up with a way to fix this, and that's basically separate this into its RGB channels. Use star alignment to use star alignment to correct uh, to align the three channels to each other, and then recombine them. And so I want to just show you how that works. So here's my chromatic aberration demo, and we're not going to use the whole image because this would just take too long. But if we zoom in, this is this is a linear image. It's had very little done to it, just background correction and some basic color calibration. And now I'm going to uh, just take a little preview. Actually, let's let's take a preview in a dark region. We don't need to see the nebula for this demo. There it is. I'm going to pull it off and we'll use this for the demo. If I zoom in to say 200%, you can see that chromatic aberration. And you see what I mean about how the direction changes a little bit, depending on where we look in the preview. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to split the RGB channels. That's a one button technique. Here they are, R, G, and B. Now we're going to use star alignment. But instead of uh, using a file on, on the hard drive, we're going to use the green channel intermediate between red and blue. And we're going to use it to register the red and the blue channels. There they are. We don't need to generate drizzle data. Rather than the default projective transformation, we're going to use the much more accurate thin plate splines with distortion correction. So that's going to look for distortion and, and fix it. It's going to assume that the files are that, that the views are a little bit different from each other. There's a potential gotcha if you happen to have a, a preview open. If this restrict to previews is checked, this won't work properly. It'll only work on the previews. We want it to work on the whole image. Once we're ready, everything's loaded up. I'm going to go ahead and apply it. And it's going to create registered versions of the red and blue channels. Hmm. The red channel didn't register. So let's take a different tack. Let's, um, again, this worked when I did this before. Uh, registered green. Let's delete the registered channel. It doesn't matter which one we pick. Uh, actually, I'll just increase the ransack tolerance. That, that should do it. Let's try that. It's having a hard time finding enough star matches. I'm just going to abort that. Let's help it detect more stars and reduce the noise a little bit. I may just have to take a larger preview to show you it. Yeah, you can see it's not finding enough stars to match. If you don't mind, I will do this on a larger preview. <clears throat> In fact, let's just do it on the whole image because I know that is definitely going to work. So let's uh, clear that. 
let's extract our channels again. This is going to take a little bit longer, I'm afraid, but it will work. So there's the green channel, and we're going to add the red and the blue and all the other settings should be fine. We'll apply it. <clears throat> like I say, it'll take longer. These are quite large files. Forty-eight thousand stars. Hopefully, this time it will find enough to match. Ron. Yes. There are some comments over on the YouTube. Uh, people were feeling really good about your demonstration because you're encountering errors just like they do every time when they're using Dix Insight. Yeah. So, you know, and when I encounter them, it's usually because I pick too small a preview that it's not, not getting a big enough statistical sample. But uh, I often tell people, actually, I think I said it already tonight. I've just made more mistakes than a lot of folks. And every time I make a mistake, you know, a lot of times when things go wrong, it's still pilot error. But you learn and, and uh, actually stop making the important mistakes. <laughs> it is working now, by the way. We got our registered red channel. And have our registered blue any second. These are drizzle process, they're about thirteen thousand pixels wide. That's why they're so big. There we go. Okay. So now um, I'm going to just zoom back out. We now have, I don't, I don't need the original red and blue channels anymore. I've got the registered blue, the registered red, and the registered green channels here. And um, just before I combine them, you can look at them. They're each uh, a mono image. There's the red. Here's the blue. So let's just shrink these down, get them out of the way. Now I will use my preview to demo this. So now I have three channels that are aligned to each other. And if I go into channel management and pull up channel combination, I can use the registered red for the red channel, green for the green channel, and the registered blue for the blue channel. And watch the magic here. I'm just going to go to the most extreme part of the problem. Ready, here we go. Boom. So let's before, after, before, after. Improves the usable field a lot. That is a very smart sausage making technique. Thank you very much. The cool thing is, is that, so you saw, if we, if we look here, 
the aberration is down and to the right. The red is down and to the right. Here's the worst part of it right there. But if we now go to the top, make a new preview up here. See, this aberration is in a different direction. It's up and to the right. The nice thing about this technique is it fixes everything. Each corner gets the fix that it needs. So if we apply that to the whole image, and now uh, I'll just delete these previews. I'm just gonna zoom in to the top right, bottom right, bottom left, top left. That's after, there's before. Any questions about that? Nothing here except praise. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right, let me head back to my PowerPoint for a second. No, it's it's awesome, Ron. Uh, it's this is a you know uh, some a, me a method that you developed. It's not listed like it's not a process. You know, you said, hey, here's a problem. How could I solve this? What are the tools that are available to me and what can I do? And you came out with a method. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think if you like that one, you're going to like this one. It's a little bit more mathematically complicated, but I'm, I've tried to put it in words here. So, you know, when you get to the end of what you think is a really beautiful picture and then you look at it up close and it's still got that sort of in the background, You've got some dark modeling, some dark pixels that are uh, like little black holes in the in the background. Um, that's a detect and correct type of problem. If we could find those pixels and selectively just brighten the ones that we identify as dark, that is a good fix. So the method that I developed uses pixel math. And it's basically using yeah, what in, in computer language would be called an if then else statement. So if some condition is true, do something. Otherwise, do something else. In this case, we're, we're going to say if uh, the IIF stands for if and only if. If and only if the pixel is too dark, brighten it. Otherwise, leave it alone. So then the question is just, how do we mathematically figure out whether a pixel is darker than it ought to be for where it is in a particular image? And to do that, we're gonna use a pixel math expression. We're gonna use these symbols, dollar $t followed by a number, zero is red, one is green, two is blue. Dollar $t stands for the target image. And I'm gonna use a, a variable that you'll see a which defines the brightest pixel that is going to get corrected because we want to be very limiting here only to correct very dark pixels. And then we want to figure out how much correction to apply. So let's go have a look. I'm going to get rid of these right now. So here is... Um, this is a stretched image. It's not a lot of data. It's about three and a half hours of data. And I processed it just to see what, what was going to be in there. Uh, and if you look at the background, if you look at the background, it actually looks pretty nice, um, relatively smooth, considering what it is. But that's because it's not stretched. You can see it's not stretched because I don't have a green line here. Sometimes when I'm critically examining a photo, I'm looking for the defects. So looking at it in this way isn't very helpful to me. I'm going to put an auto stretch on it, a boosted auto stretch on it, so that I can really see what's wrong with this image. If I go in here and really stretch that, 
Now I can see this is a little bit less than perfect, isn't it? Of course, it doesn't show this way when we're when we're looking at it. Um, you know the way it's going to be presented unstretched, but right now I'm trying to find the problems, and I'm seeing some dark, dark pixels. Do you see them around here? Uh, these little black flecks, and if I if I zoom in even more, you can see them better. Here's some here and over here. And if I left click on my mouse, I can see the brightness value of these pixels. They're down around 0 0.08, 0 0.09. They're quite a bit fainter than even very closely adjacent pixels, which are around 0 0.12, 0 0.11. You see that difference? Um, let's go to another example. Here's a dark one over here. It's down around 0 0.08, 0 0.09, right next door above 0.1. So keep that in your mind. And now let's look at the pixel math. Here it is. So it's one channel at a time. The red, the green, and the blue are going to be processed differently. A is going to be the brightest thing, uh, the, yeah, the brightest thing that's going to get affected. And we want it to be just about as bright as these dark pixels. That way we won't affect other things. So again, I'm going to pick a value of 0 0.10 to start based on our inspection that we just did. Now let's take this apart. If red is less than A, in other words, if red is less than 10%, point 0.1, do something. Otherwise, leave it alone. We'll talk about the do something in a minute. You can see it's the same each time, just for the different channels. So let's, we'll come back to the do something. I really want you to get the logic here. If and only if, the red channel is less than 0.1. Do something. Otherwise, leave it alone. Okay, let's look at the do something. And to look at the do something, uh, I want to find my magnifier. So we're going to work our way from the middle out to understand what the do something expression means. So the first thing we have to do is find the median of that channel. The median, half the pixels are brighter than that value and half the pixels are less than that value. Since most images of deep sky are mostly very dark, the median turns out to be a pretty good estimate of the background. So we're going to find the median and subtract the value of the dark pixel from it. That's the amount of the correction. That's the amount of the difference between what we thought the pixel should be and what it's actually measuring. And what we want to do is add, a we want to multiply that by something and add it to the original value. So figure out what the background is, find out the difference between the background and the current value of the pixel is, and take a fraction of that and add it to the original value. Let's try it. Did you see that disappear? This is very surgical. Now, why would I not say maybe make this one? Why would I not add the entire amount of that difference? Because then it turns it into plastic. We have to do some blending. 
I usually find a value between 0.25 and 0.5 works well. In this case, I'm pretty confident that 0.5 is too much. Yeah. Now, you might also say, well, I'm being too aggressive. I'm correcting pixels that are too bright. We could lower this a little bit and then maybe be more aggressive on how much we add. So find fewer pixels, but correct them more. So that's the power of pixel math. If red is less than 0 0.09, find the difference between the expected brightness and the actual brightness and add 35% of it to the current red value. Otherwise, leave it alone. All right. I'm done. What can I answer for you? Well, before we get any more questions, uh... I'd like to say this was just a superb presentation, Rod. So thank you oh, very thank much. Thank you. And we have right now we have 69 people watching over on YouTube. Wow. That's quite an audience. Should I stop sharing my screen or do I will people want to see uh, more on Pix Insight? Um, and questions, I mean. By the way, I never did show you how this act so. Remember, we have a boosted auto stretch on this. And, and you see how subtle that changes. It really does make a difference in the final image. But it's subtle. And as I often say, if you can see I did it, I did too much of it. Could you be less aggressive and run it multiple times? Would that be worth trying? I don't know. Why don't you try it and let me know? Okay. Uh, that's good. You've breathed a little bit more life into my STL. So thank you very much. No problem. We do have a question from um, John uh, asking about um, Starlink trails. Is that, okay. Is that worth exploring here? With uh, do you have any comments about satellite trails? Yeah, if you've got if, sense, yeah. if you've got trails of any kind, they're not going to be in the same place in every sub. By the way, uh, I was working a couple of weeks ago with a pretty well-known astrophotographer that did think that he did have a Starlink trail in every sub, um, but they're not geostationary. Uh, I've I've watched them go by. So um, in the end, we diagnosed it to a diffraction spike coming from a bright star that was outside the field. So those are harder to correct. But it, for satellite trails, they're relatively easy to correct. Uh, when you're doing your image integration, you can't do this in batch pre-processing, by the way. Um, in image integration, there's this there's this tab called large scale pixel rejection. If you select high large scale structures here for rejection, it'll reject satellite trails, airplanes, all that kind of stuff. Ron, uh, could you share your uh, coming up classes, uh, the website, how people could uh, sign up? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I actually included that in the presentation so that it's on the record. Yeah, but just, just do it one more time right here. For, for people who joined again later. Yeah, it's right here, right there. And uh, I think I even have it open just a second here. Yeah, there we go. So if you go to ipforap.com and click on workshops, you have a choice of Buffalo or San Diego. And if we go to Buffalo, uh, you get an overview of the workshop. You'll see who all our sponsors are. 
information about the venue, uh, lodging, registration, cost. We've got an early bird special uh, for the next period of time. Notice we're giving away a, a, a QHY CMOS camera, 168C. I think that's worth, I don't know, 15, 1800 bucks. 30% off coupon towards a 367C. We've got uh, gift coupons from Optolong as well. Uh, there's the agenda that you can refer to here as well. And if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Yeah, all things considered, I'd rather be in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, the days are pretty full. Uh, we go nine until four, and they are uh, they're full fun days. Uh, we, I mean, we work hard, but we really do have a lot of fun. Now, when people come to these, they bring their own computer and their own data, right? Yes. Well, yeah, but if they don't have data, we provide all the data for all of the workshop content. Okay, we use our data for all of the, the technical content, but you'll see there's some process your own data sessions. For those, we encourage people to bring their own data and then we can help them, you know, with wherever they are in Hicks Insight, they can get extra help from us. So if they're far ahead of the class or far behind, they can still uh, up their game, you know? Um, and there's four of these sessions. So there's one in the morning and one in the afternoon on each day. Terry, did you see any more questions over on YouTube? That looks pretty clear here. No, no questions that I can see. Okay, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I just I want to thank you once again. It's an excellent presentation, and I can't remember when we've had more people watching. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, excellent presentation. Uh, just to let you guys know, we're off next week, and we do need present present presenters for the next two weeks. Uh, I'm in the process of negotiating one. Uh, Three weeks from now, uh, actually, let me open the uh, calendar. I thought it was free. I didn't know you negotiated, Tolga. Um, it's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm negotiating dates. <laughs> uh, on February 23rd, Robert Nemiroff, uh, who is one of the uh, people who selects iPod, the ast uh, Astro astronomical picture of the day uh he's going to be coming in he's going to be telling us uh first he's going to show us the highlights of 2019 best of 2019 and he's also going to t tell us the process of how they select a pods mm -hmm. uh so that's, that should be a very interesting uh presentation uh but that's it for now yeah, I think we're all set. Uh, Toga, are you uh, ready to end the session? Yep, we're good. Good night, well, everybody. Uh, you can hang out with us a little bit. We'll yeah. you know, keep the session open. Okay.